Uh, my name is Peter Gallagher. I'm with Unisys Federal Systems. I am uh, the manager who runs the Federal Portfolio Solutions team. And so team at Unisys stands for Technology Evolution for Agility and Mobility. I get to work with some really smart architects and solution designers in the areas of security, uh, data center transformation, app modernization, and end user uh, outsourcing. I'm really happy today to be here and have with us uh, somebody who I've learned a lot from. His name's Paul Gleason. Paul, how are you? Well, thank you, Peter. Paul was kind enough to fly in last night from Seattle. So one of the great jobs I have in uh, Unisys Federal Systems is to get best practices and learn to understand from what the rest of Unisys does. 80% of our revenues come from outside of federal. So it's really fun to get to learn about some of the other things we're doing outside of federal and bring them back in and see which ones them apply and which ones can assist us in, in, uh, with our federal customers. So the types of companies that Paul works with, uh, you know a lot of them. Uh, sometimes we mention their names or not, but we're, we're running their software today. You use their software every day and uh, they make some fantastic products. Uh, if, like me, you drink their coffee every day, you probably enjoy it. Um, additionally, I don't always admit how many I eat, but I like their hamburgers. So there are consumer companies, there are banks, there are industrial companies that Paul supports, mission critical support uh, in the U.S. and in Europe. So he has about a thousand folks uh, delivering this mission critical support. And our, th our theme here today is that there's a lot to be learned from some of these experiences that Paul's encountered uh, over this great recession. Thanks, Peter. So welcome, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you all for having me here. Yeah. So, Paul, in uh, 2008, I'm, I'm the moderator, but since there's only one person, I'm not the moderator. I'm the facilitator. But I'm going to facilitate with Paul here. We've had some of these conversations. I have some new questions for you. But in 2008, in September, Lehman Brothers went under. That was the first real financial impact. So your, your customers, talk about them a little bit and how they started to react to that trauma, which we had a lot of talk today. In each of the sessions, there's talk about budget cuts, budget cuts, what do we do? We're talking innovation, but in the end, we're focused on these budget cuts. So talk a little bit about how, how the commercial sector reacted to that. So uh, it's interesting listening to the, the keynotes this morning and they're talking about doing more with less and the, the cry for innovation and the call for productivity improvements. That's exactly what the commercial sector experienced after the, the recession when Lehman crashed. Uh, and the way they dealt with it was interesting because um, it really forced the change in thinking. It, it caused some courageous leadership decisions and it caused a, a real hard look at how they actually executed their business on a day-to-day -day basis. And from a technology point of view, um, there were some real quantum shifts in the way that CIOs approached their business. Uh, it, it used to be, they used to have this language or what they call a currency, where they would talk in terms of units of measurement that was you know, appropriate for the organization. So if you're a shipping container, a shipping company, you talk in terms of 40-foot equivalent units. If you're a software company, it's how many software units you ship out the door. That was sort of standard business practices prior to the recession. But post-recession, there was a new currency that was creeping into the conversations I've been having with the CIOs around the world. And that is one of productivity, measuring productivity. And, and what they cottoned onto very quickly, which is kind of exciting, was the idea of end user satisfaction drives productivity more than anything else. We'd heard about mining data, using big data, measuring. This is what the commercial sector did very, very well. And they, they learned that to be able to mine their data to how do you improve productivity, the fundamental root cause of that is actually engagement and customer satisfaction, and the customer being the end user. We're at the, the, on the cusp, I suppose, of what, what they're calling the people computing revolution right now, and they're getting ready for the people computing revolution. And by that we mean the notion that everyone's going to have a tablet device or a smartphone, and they want to access the data, they want to access the network, the security access points that they need to provide. The world is moving on from just the old desktop computers. And what they've done is they're enabling the end users to have greater end experience so they can be greater productivity for their organizations. Yeah, thank you. So, so Paul, I was uh, and getting ready for this. I talked to a couple of my federal colleagues. And I said, you know, we have this commercial talk. We want to find out what's going on. And the, the CIO said to me, he said, well, our world is so different. I mean, you don't, you don't have protests. You don't have the same sort of hands-off relationships that we, we tend to have to have sometimes between contractors and acquisition staff. Can you talk a little bit about what's, 
what's the same? I know you've done some public sector work uh, in federal Australia and other places, but can you talk a little bit about that? It's, it's actually more similar than you realize. Um, there's a lot of lessons that can be learned by the federal practice. Um, the, the timing is probably the thing that's the most different right now. They've sort of faced this whole issue back in 2009 was when the real changes in the quantum you know, thinking had to happen and the innovation. Uh, but if you break it down to the lowest common denominator, which is we talked about productivity and end user and people computing, um, that's the stuff that's common across all sectors, be it public or private. There's no difference in my opinion. Yeah. And, and Paul, a lot of the discussions here, there's, there's one session today on, on how to cut staff, for instance. Uh, so I've, I've heard uh, a lot of focus on, on that's the way that some of these entities got ahead when they hit these challenges. So the budget cuts are coming. How do I, how do I respond to that? Do I, do I cut staff? Is that, is that how the commercial sector responded? Certainly some did that approach. Uh, but I, I would argue some of the smarter companies out there and the ones that we've been working with um, viewed it differently. Um, in, in economics terms, there's the thing called potential GDP, which is you know, the realization of the most you can out of your workforce. And the only way you can actually shift your GDP is either to increase uh, staff which wasn't really an option for the commercial sector, uh, or increase productivity. So the notion of moving the, moving the GDP line further along, getting more out of your staff, became more of, a, more of an issue than actually cutting costs. Sure, there are other ways of cutting costs, such as vendor management systems and other strategies around looking at technology from a holistic view and getting ready for the people computing revolution, because as we heard in the previous speakers, that there are some benefits with the lighter footprint, the lighter agility in terms of the end users being able to be more mobile. But ultimately, you know, it wasn't all about cost cutting. And in fact, some of it was actually counterintuitive. And if you think about the notion of trying to delight the end user because you want them to be more productive, and if you run with that premise for a little bit, you can get to a point where there's companies such as Microsoft who've actually moved their service center back from India to America in Salt Lake City. They do it for core business hours because they get a better user satisfaction, a greater user experience, and by bringing it onshore rather than offshore, which was the paradigm previously, they're actually finding that they're getting greater, greater customer satisfaction. Greater customer satisfaction, greater user experience, greater productivity. Um, it's, it's almost counterintuitive to the way people were focusing, taking costs out, cutting, cutting, cutting. Now the paradigm's shifting a little bit more to allowing the end users to be enabled and have that flexibility in terms of the devices that they want to bring to the workplace. And how do they, how do they justify that, Paul? Because it sounds like it would cost a lot more money to, to bring those resources back to the US. How do, they, how do they prove to their shareholders that they're saving money? Well, there's, there's several things. The first thing they do is they measure. Um, we heard about that in the previous speakers, how important it is to measure everything. You don't know how you're succeeding unless you have a baseline and how you measure your work and productivity. Most enterprise cor corporations today survey their end users. Unisys does it as well. We, we survey every single one of our employees that are working on various programs to get their feedback and just testing how they're buying into the program and what could we be doing better, smarter, faster. So in terms of the bigger organizations, they justify it by measuring the performance measuring the satisfaction, and indeed measuring the productivity. Hmm. And user productivity. So uh, I wanted to comment in the, in the federal sector, what I've, some of the things I've seen in terms of our initiatives out there over the last couple of years to really begin to address this, this budgetary problem relate to, sh to shared services, relate to reuse. So we had cloud first, which is a reuse strategy. How do we reuse more things? We have shared first, another reuse strategy. But I haven't seen to the extent uh, in federal that we see in the private sector, this focus on the GDP, if you will, the productivity of those workers. Because you're either going to add more workers to increase your GDP, or you're going to have to make those workers more productive. And I think that that's a big difference between the focus I've seen out visiting uh, some of Paul's clients on the West Coast uh, and the federal government. Let me, let me bring it to life with a, a good example. Um, and that is the fact that the, the traditional thinking uh, service support model is that you know, if you have a problem, you pick up a telephone, you call, and someone answers that phone, and they help you with your problem. And, and that's been the way it's been for some time. But post-recession, with this whole focus on productivity, the, the, the paradigm really has changed. And what we're seeing now is the development of what, what effectively are smart kiosks. The idea that you can walk up with your laptop dripping with coffee and say, help, I need it fixed. 
and have someone say, why don't you go get another cup of coffee? Hopefully don't spill it this time. But more importantly, we'll replace the keyboard, we'll get you going, we'll have you going in 30 minutes. In the old days, pre-recession, you know, people would have to make a phone call, you'd wait for the field person to come, take your laptop away, order a part. It could take two, three days. In the faster, agile world that we're working in now, in terms of productivity, companies just simply can't afford to have someone idle because if your devices, your, your electronic systems, your computers, your laptops, your tablets are not online, they're not working, you're dead in the water because ultimately we all use technology every day to do our jobs. Very few people left in the world actually write and move pieces of paper by hand. It's all done electronically. So therefore, if you enable people to have those devices on all the time, I mean, we used to hear in the 80s about the idea of dial tone support. This is the dial tone support for today, and that is the notion of the fact that if your device isn't working, your productivity, you're, you're hard down. Same as tablets and phones and things. You know, a lot of the smart companies in the world right now are experimenting with notions of if your phone is down, you walk to a particular central, central uh, kiosk area, my phone is not working anymore. Well, that's no good. Use this one. You know, swap the SIM card over, I'll provision it for you, away you go. You're up, you're on, you're always on. You know, if you're disconnected from the network, you're disconnected from communication, then it's not going to work for you. And that's how they measure it right now, is so the, the value. So by shortening that life cycle, exactly. they're really making people happier, more effective, more efficient, right? Exactly. Okay, good, good. So uh, a quick question on insourcing versus outsourcing. The federal government has made a move towards insourcing certain positions. Um, it's somewhat controversial. There's a debate about it. Have you, have you seen anything like that in the private sector? Are they taking more in, more out, more consulting? The, the private sector is still definitely um, on an outsourcing cycle right now. Uh, they still feel the value and benefits in leverage and in scale. Uh, and that is certainly, I've seen no indication of, of in-housing uh, of, of those sort of systems. The, the, there are several thinkings behind that. Of course, you know, the, the, the consolidation of vendors, we talked about some of the cost cutting. Uh, one of the things that did come about post-recession was uh, procurement organisations got a lot more savvy about how they were actually sourcing. So rather than go down the path of having multiple vendors, with, they're looking and challenging their vendors to what else can you bring to the table so I can get a greater book of business? Because from a, from a support point of view, from a commercial company's point of view, the fewer vendors you have to work with, the easier it is. The more streamlined the governance model, the more, more practical the actual day-to-day -day engagement becomes. However, having said that, there's still a large number of opportunities and, and support that needed to be provided for all environments. So the, the challenge or the strategy is, is for vendors to learn how to actually expand their portfolio and learn how to manage other vendors and work in terms of, we heard the previous speaker talk about sharing, sh sharing the love, sharing the pain, sharing the opportunity to support. So we're seeing a lot more innovative governance models, a lot more, more um, strategic thinking in terms of how you actually uh, support the, 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 the customers. And there's some lessons there I feel that can be applied certainly to the federal place okay. as well. Yeah, I know you're working with a large organization in Paris right now. Um, not to mention names, but, but they're looking at consolidation. How, how dispersed were they? When I think of a federal agency with a lot of agencies, some of them have 20, 30 help desks and other support mechanisms. What, what, what's, what are they doing in, with, with that organization? Um, this large operation in Europe is a, is a manufacturing company right now, and uh, their, their ch challenges right now is that the fact that the, the commercial sector is all talking about emerging markets, and they all want to, you know, the, the big focus areas, the, the, the Brazils, the Russias, the India, the China, South Africa, the Indonesias. Um, and, and their challenge is that they've been focused predominantly on Europe, which is the market that they've been working on. And, and what they're learning very quickly is that um, they've, they, they've, they haven't reacted as fast enough as they could to the market forces. The market has moved on, from, and, and they sort of miss that, that, that wave of innovation. So what they're doing is they're working, they've decided strategically to reach out to vendors to help them get to that, that point. So one of the advantages, I suppose, of using a sourcing provider is you do get the ability to leapfrog a technology. You know, sometimes you get people who are stuck on old technologies, on Windows XPs and, and, and old platforms. And to get over that, that internal inertia, that, that, that status quo point that we heard the previous talker talk about, Sourcing can be a great way and a great catalyst for making that sort of change, and that's exactly what they're engaging yeah. us to do. And uh, Dave Wenigren in his talk there made a really compelling point to me that you know the, he talked about the baby and 75 or 80 percent of our f 
funding for IT goes to support those, those legacy environments. How, how do you see that? Are there any differences that, that you see in the commercial sector relative to dealing with, with the older stuff versus investing in the new stuff to get ahead? And competition, how do they compete? Well, well, the investment is still, they have the same challenges as the federal, and as much that there's still this keep the lights on paradigm where they've got to basically, they've got to continue to do what they're doing. But the challenge that, that the, the commercial industry faces is that there's a lot of competition. There's only one Department of Defence, okay? There's, there's several software manufacturers, there's several manufacturers of cars, there's several manufacturers of other technologies. So, so from their point of view, it's about how do they keep ahead of the curve? So when, when post-recession came, the first instinct is to hunker down and basically you know, just do what we're doing well and, and weather the storm. But, but that's not really a good long-term strategy, uh, particularly in the commercial sector. And, and it's well documented. There's lots of books out there that talk about the need to, to grow and expand during recessions. During great recessions come great ideas, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the, the productivity push, the paradigm change there. Um, there's a lot more courageous thinking going on now than I have seen in a long time. Uh, and by courageous thinking, I'm thinking these are people who are prepared to, to you know, take a risk. They're moving to the cloud. They're moving to you know, embrace their end user computing. They're, they're trying something that they probably wouldn't normally have done. They're getting out of their comfort zone, but they have no choice because they know if they don't do it, the competitor is going to do it. So it's, it's, it's a very high stakes game that the, the commercial industry is in right now. Now, the lesson that can be applied here, I think, is self evident, is that. You know, getting out of the comfort zone and, and taking a bit of a risk responsibly and dutifully, but, but nevertheless, you know, there are opportunities to, to move into a new area um, yeah. that, that may, you wouldn't have seen the need to do um, prior to the situation we find ourselves in now. That's great. Yeah, that's very interesting. So, so, Paul, one of the things you've taught me the most about was alignment of the goals from your side of the table as the contractor and the customer. I know you spent a lot of time focusing on the fact that it's a huge challenge in government with our acquisition system sometimes where we have to write a contract for five years. And for instance, if, if you were to have a contract where a commercial contract, I said to you, for the next five years, this is your SLA, how would you react to something like that? Well, I'll answer that in a second. But I, I, you, one of the exciting changes that's come up recently is uh, the whole notion of, of looking at governance. Uh, we talked a little bit before about you know, having multiple vendors and, 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 and that was one of the catalysts in terms of the way that companies approach sourcing relationships has significantly developed and matured over the last few years. The, the, the governance that's applied to this is becoming more and more collaborative. And if you're going to write anything down today, or at least out of this session, write down the word alignment, because I think this is key. Uh, some exciting changes that we've seen right now out there in the marketplace are companies where from the CIO right down to the service provider are all carrying the same commitments, and that is performance, performance, break, uh, performance objectives around service levels, and executables that are absolutely measurable. And having that sort of alignment, so for some of the bigger customers that we work with right now, all the vendors, no matter who you are, if you're working for that customer, you're carrying a service level agreement around customer satisfaction. And the CIO of that organization down to the, the support person in the field is still carrying that same goal. So when you get to a, 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 an awkward situation, and awkward stuff happens all the time, what you do is, when you're all in the room pulling in the same direction, because you're all gold and compensated on the same, same objectives, it makes a, a lot easier conversation than the old days when you had that old adversarial confrontational. So what you're seeing is a movement away from the, the vendor uh, supplier confrontational approach to one of more of partnership. And alignment's what, how you accomplish that. And you can accomplish a lot more, I can assure you, working together than working against each other. And, and that is one of the key changes that's happened in the last couple of years, uh, is the idea of you know, having that working together. So to, to your question around the service levels, um, service levels are absolutely needed. Guaranteed, you would, should be foolish to sign a contract with any service provider about some sort of detailed service level regime. But the, the, the trick is now, is having that flexibility with the service levels. Because a service level that you write today might be really practical in two years' time. We talked about the people computing paradigm, the revolution that's happening. 
Who knows how we're going to be supporting environments in two, three years' time when everyone's carrying a tablet, for instance? Is that going to require a different service level, a different rethink? So the, the smart contracts, the smart agreements that we're seeing now are, are baking in provisions to have that flexibility so that they can move and adapt and evolve as the business moves going forward. And I think that that's something that could be applied to the federal space as well. And how do you evolve that with the customer? How does that, how does that cycle work? How does that cycle of, of changing those SLAs of continuous service improvement work? We formally um, approach it by having a, a, a regular cadence where we actually review it to make sure that the meetings and the contracts that we have, the agreements that we have in place, are they still relevant to your business? One thing I will have to tell you in the commercial sector is that things change very fast. So we'll do a five-year agreement and after two years in that agreement, we've, we know that the, the customer's directions have moved in a completely different direction. So rather than try and force and struggle along with an agreement that doesn't necessarily flow and make a lot of sense because the customer's world has changed and you're holding them back, you suddenly become an anchor and you're actually you're, you're, you're holding back a customer from being as innovative as they need to be. So the way we approach this is that we have a regular checkpoint which we normally bake into our agreements where we review the purpose of the agreements and the benefits and make sure that they are aligned. And it's a healthy conversation. It's something we, we look forward to when we do with our customers. So your customer, your, your direct customer has the same SLA as you have in terms of their, their bonus and their performance? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Alignment is, is key, and I can't emphasize it enough. So you would never make a five-year fixed SLA agreement and say, that's it? I would certainly do a five-year agreement. And there's some t don't get me wrong, there, there may be a service level that's good for five years, but you need to have the ability or the mechanism to review them and see if they do make sense. Um, similarly, the, the old thinking of ratcheting down service levels every year tighter and tighter and tighter, all that drives is silly behaviour because it actually stifles innovation. Uh, you heard Congressman Van Halen talk a little about the importance of innovation. Uh, I, I can't begin to tell you how important that is. Uh, there's been a lot of research published over the last few years of failed service agreements. And, and when you do a root cause of those, it almost invariably comes down to lack of governance and lack of innovation. And innovation is one of those other areas that's a true partnership. Um, innovation is not just the aha, eureka moment, you know, the lightning bolt. That's fantastic. You know, why didn't we think of that before? We're all professionals. All the easy stuff's been done already. It's, it's the clever stuff that hasn't been thought of yet. So innovation is actually micro steps. So the, the, the process that we have inside Unisys, and other companies do it as well, I have to add, is that we treat innovation as being a series of small micro steps forward, okay? Testing, proving, executing, moving on to the next thing. So, so the way we treat innovation is to have an innovation program. And we keep on innovating the innovation program to keep it fresh and current as well. Um, but the innovation has to become part of the culture and it has to come with leadership. So if you ever, you know, it, and, and it has to come with both parties sitting in the room talking about innovation jointly. Because if there's not a charter, a mission statement that drives the goals for innovation together, then it's not going to work. And you create uh, project plans, don't you, for those innovations? So, so how many projects would you have going in sort of your, your regular innovation cycles? We typically, run, we typically run between six to eight large innovation projects at the same time. We run it as a program, so a program with a subset of projects. And we appoint project managers with sponsors. And this is a nice point. We, we talked about the partnership and the alliance. We always insist that the customer has a sponsor as well as a sponsor from the Unisys side. So there's joint stakeholders. We identify the outcomes, we measure the baseline, we measure the outcome. We put a, a line underneath it, we agree the benefits, and then we move on. And, and similarly too, I want to point out that if we have an innovation opportunity that someone comes up with and it doesn't achieve the mission statement, we won't pursue it. So it has to have mutually benefit goals, otherwise innovation, if it works for just one party, is not really a long-term sustainable. It's got to help both parties, not innovation for the sake of one party. And that's key. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. So we only have about five minutes left. I apologize that we haven't had a lot, a lot of time for Q&A. We may have time for one or two at the end, but um, wanted to, we only had 30 minutes. So I wanted to go ahead with Paul and sort of, can we summarize some of these lessons learned? I mean, this sounds a lot different than the typical beat the contractor over the head because he didn't hit his SLA sort of relationship. I mean, I've, I've been out to visit Paul's customers and when they don't hit an SLA, 
there's a joint meeting that why did we not hit our SLA? Uh, it isn't what Paul did wrong, it's what did we as a team not achieve? So I think it's really a fundamentally different way of looking at things. And also this GDP view of looking at the, at the uh, individual as the, as the person who's gonna drive the growth, the people do the work. Uh, the data's great, but it's the people doing the work. So talk a little bit about, if you can summarize some of these, some of these thoughts. Yeah, I, I mean, the, 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 key, the key change, I think, and we talked a little bit about you know, what happened post-recession, that, that they really, the commercial practices um, enterprise really had to make some changes very, very quickly, because they knew that their competition was gonna make changes as well. Um, and, and where they actually uh, focused their attention was actually with the procurement departments because that was where the real change needed to come. Because it's, it's fascinating when you actually have a collaborative procurement cycle and, and work very collaboratively and, and bring in that culture of partnership and demanding innovation from your service providers, um, that change actually you know, originated with the acquisition offices rather than actually with the IT department. And, and that was something that was quite unusual because we hadn't seen that in the past. Mm -hmm. But working with them in those areas has enabled um, a significant amount of um, quantum leaps in some cases around governance, the flexibility, the partnership, the innovation. But also, uh, we talked before about the end user computing. I, I cannot begin to tell you, this people computing revolution is coming. You all see the tablets. I've seen an enormous amount of iPads here today already floating around with people taking notes. This is the, the new platform, and how do we support that? Because the way that we support them today is going to be different in two years' time. Good. So, um, Paul, I've really learned a lot from you over the last uh, couple of years. It's really fascinating to see how the commercial sector does things uh, differently. We have uh, a yellow light up, so we have a couple of minutes left. Does anybody have a, a question that they'd like to, uh, pose, to pose to Paul? Can you tell where I'm from? I, I, I see the, 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 not so much the role changing, but the role developing, uh, and that is developing into a, an, an opportunity to look at how do you um, lead that cultural change. I mean, the, there were some themes that we heard in the keynote this morning which resonated with me very closely, and that is the fact that it's, it's the courageous leadership that's needed right now. And, and I feel that there's some opportunities to provide that courageous leadership. And, and the culture of change, um, you know, technology will come. I mean, it's, it's all about dealing with the people's sides of all that. Uh, and, and using of data to measure that as well, which we talked a little bit earlier in the previous speaker. So I, I feel that the, the CIO role won't, won't change, it'll evolve into something that's more, um, more working closely with the partners, leveraging their expertise and what they're seeing. I also feel and sense that in the federal space, uh, there's gonna be a lot more synergy with what's been going on in the commercial sector. Because I feel that what's happening there, as I said earlier, I think that everything can apply to the federal. I think it's just there's a time gap. But I don't think there's anything other than a time gap issue right now. Fantastic. So I want to thank you all for coming. We're just, we're just uh, running out of time here. But it's really fascinating to see that we're in the IT track here. And we didn't talk once about which technologies he uses. And the scale, I guess we answer 700 million trouble calls a year and so how that scale and that technology is driven across problem resolution schemes across different customers around the world but I have one last question for you Paul do your commercial customers get together in any way to help solve problems do yeah they, absolutely do they get together to, we, we, we to do, do problem resolution? we do we do industry um, communities of interest we do uh, regular reviews and meetings we actually just hosted an event down in Florida uh, similarly we also have uh, global communities of interest particularly in something like retail uh, where we actually get together and we share best practices and ideas. So we actually bring our customers together to share. And that's something that we talked a little bit about, heard a little bit earlier yeah. this morning about sharing of ideas and how invaluable it is because we all have the same problems. 
it really is the same. It's just a question of you know, communicating and getting it out there. Get the people together. OK, folks, uh, thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. Thank Five you. seconds. <laughs>